Hi right, guys, I am thrilled to announce that it is a rainy day, hallelujah, it is a rainy day for once here in the drought plagued wasteland of the Finger Lakes of New York here at Bugs in a Jar Farm where I finally get a little bit of water in my pond to float my ducks here on this glorious it is a Thursday. It is August 4th, 2022, and I noticed that uh, it has been a while since I have brought you, gone over there to oilprice.com to see what's on the minds of all those fossil fuel investors. I see I'm going to have some... Uh, and I have some mosquitoes blowing into the tiny house as I take shelter from the rain. Anyway, uh, I know sometimes that uh, oilprice.com, my fellow doomers wonder what you're doing over here. But I, uh, I, I highly recommend oilprice.com for anyone trying to figure out how this various waves this planet is collapsing. So... I am thrilled to see that we have two doomers that I uh, have talked about and even interviewed one of these a couple of times. We're going to hear both from from two energy analysts uh, today, from Kurt Cobb and Gail Tverberg. Uh, heard from Gail, several of those. She's a regular contributor to oilprice.com. I'm going to come back in the second half of this rant and just check out the highlights of hers. But we're going to start off with this fellow who I've also read uh, essays from before. Haven't heard from Kurt in a while. Glad to see him over at oilprice.com. Um... Okay, and what's on Kurt Cobb's mind is can the world really adapt to climate change? And the takeaways from his fairly short essay, the ongoing heat wave in Europe is highlighting some very real problems brought about by climate change. The infrastructure we have built just is not made to stand up to this kind of heat. Yes, some believe that the world will simply adapt to climate change, though adaptation could compound the problem over time a bit. So take it away, Kurt Cobb, and fill in these blanks, and then we'll get over to Gail and have her join the course. Climate change deniers have had to adjust their story in recent years as the effects of climate change have become more and more apparent to people where they live all around the world. The first iteration was that climate change, climate change is good, it will make winters milder, <coughs> and it will help fertilize crops with additional carbon dioxide, which all plants need to manufacture the food they live on. While the greening effect of rising carbon dioxide concentrations is real, you know, there is usually some little kernel of truth in all of this uh, disinformation being pumped out there all over these climate deniers' uh, websites. There is a limit to how much it will help plants. As for milder winters, they may be good for some and worse for others. Uh, they'd be good for me. That's why I'm a climate uh, refugee. While they result in diminished snows in critical watersheds such as the Himalayas and the Alps, the effect can be diminished water supplies particularly at crucial times in summer when mountain snow melt can stabilize flows in key streams and rivers that might otherwise be very low so that they can provide irrigation water 
and water for human consumption. So now the deniers argue that we can just adapt. This is, of course, the path of least resistance since it requires no major changes in business as usual. Let's see how that is working out. Yes, in the ongoing European heat wave, airport runways are melting, railroad tracks are melting, and roads are buckling, and roofs are melting. The infrastructure we have built just is not made to stand up to this kind of heat. But the indirect effects of climate change are just as important. Power generation is heavily dependent on water, as drought reduces available water supplies electricity generation can be affected. Most generation plants use steam to power turbines when water is in short supply. This hampers generation. Water scarcity is, of course, directly responsible for reductions in hydroelectric generation. And then there's two more stories right in this list of their regular news stories. They have one in here about the Rhine River uh, in Germany is, is so low and that they move all of these fossil fuels, uh, you know, on the Rhine River. And so a lot of these fossil fuels are 100% dependent on, you know, the water levels in the Rhine River being able to move the fossil fuel barges. So you have fossil fuel barges being piled up and drying up rivers while Kurt is writing this story. And then right next to that, they have an article that, uh, you know, as rivers and water in general gets warmer, that nuclear power plants, you know, they need a constant supply of cold water and as warmer the water gets, the more worthless it is to cool nuclear power. So it's uh, obviously it's hydropower, and you can and, and now it's cutting into nuclear power, and it's even cutting into fossil fuel power. Who are dealing, you know, on uh, on rivers to float their barges, and then of course we have the railroad tracks melting, uh, and and we have the airport tarmacs uh, buckling. Anyway. All of this right in uh, th this week's compendium, everything that Kurt is saying. Y you can find news from all over the planet backing him up. Anyway, then there is the problem of increased consumption in no small part due to increased use of air conditioning. This, of course, creates a vicious cycle in which increased consumption of electricity generated by fossil fuels aggravates climate change, which then leads to higher temperatures, then which leads to the increased use of air conditioning. Now, I sold both of my air conditioners here at Bugs in a Jar Farm last year, so we had no air conditioners at Bugs in a Jar Farm, but of course, realize, 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 just went and bought a new air conditioner to put in his bedroom two days ago. <laughs> just can't win. Uh, anyway, if this is what the climate change deniers mean by adaptation, their argument is defeated on the spot an adaptation that makes matters worse creates the need for more adaptation and more after that. There is, of course, the cost of damage done by increasing flooding, both in coastal areas and elsewhere, and then there is the need to find more water 
for areas becoming drier due to drought. Meaning all the stuff we just talked about. You can see these, uh, these feedback loops forming all over the place. The adaptation feedback loops. Finally, there are the droughts affecting crops worldwide and driving up food prices. Droughts now spreading across the globe just as climate models predicted. Today, we have drought in Europe, the United States, Mexico, Argentina, Mauritania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Djibouti, and Eritrea. There are certainly more in others that don't encompass a substantial part of the country, but are nevertheless consequential. Companies are working on more drought-resistant and heat-resistant strains of grain, but they cannot reshape all crops anytime soon, for instance, orchards that are not replanted every year. And the deniers forget that their preferred policy of inaction means that climate change will be a continuously moving target, increasing in intensity and scope far into the future. There is no definitive maximum for carbon in the atmosphere under the deniers plan. So far, the adaptation strategy does not seem like it is succeeding. It's more like coping and we have a lot of coping ahead of us for failing to take prevention seriously. Yes, and so next to uh, Kurt Cobb's opinion piece, we have uh, Gail Tverberg, who is becoming quite the regular uh, contributor to oil price Dot com. Now, I have interviewed Gail twice now, I believe. I kind of feel like I've interviewed Kurt Cobb, but maybe not. Uh, now, Gail, you know, tends to write book-length manuscripts. So what I'm going to do with Gail's, uh, since it would take me two hours to read this thing, uh, is... Uh, I'm going to read her her introduction, uh, her bold face points, and the conclusion. Okay, uh, the takeaway, you know, oilprice.com always does the takeaway. So the takeaway, according to Gail Tverberg, is the price of energy has been too low for producers in recent years while the price of extraction has increased. This will cause the global economy to shrink. Did I tell you the name of her uh, essay is Today's Energy Crisis Spells Disaster for the Global Economy. So as the economy changes from growth to shrinkage, the rate of shrinkage of GDP will be greater than the rate of shrinkage of energy consumption. Do you think so, Gail? And as interest rates rise, energy supplies will become even tighter, leading to a shortage of goods, a potential increase in conflict, and rising debt. Okay, Gail, this is her introduction. It is my view that when energy supply falls, it falls not because reserves run out. It falls because economies around the world cannot afford to purchase goods and services made with energy products and using energy products in their operation. It is really a price problem. Prices 
cannot be simultaneously high enough for oil producers to ramp up production and remain low enough for consumers around the world to buy the goods and services that they are accustomed to buying. Yes, we are now in a period of price conflict. Oil and other energy prices have remained, well, up until now, I guess, too low for producers since at least mid-2014. At the same time, depletion of fossil fuels has led to higher cost of extraction. Often, the tax needs of governments of oil exporting countries are higher as well, leading to even higher required prices for producers if they are to continue to produce oil and raise their production, thus producers truly require higher prices. Governments of countries affected by this inflation in price are quite disturbed. Higher prices for energy products mean higher prices for all goods and services. This makes citizens very unhappy because wages do not rise to compensate for this inflation. Prices today are high enough to cause significant inflation. But, we I mean talking about oil prices, but still not high enough to satisfy the high price needs of energy producers. I am not going to get in an argument with Gail Tverberg, okay? But I do wish that she would comment somewhere in here about the record profits, the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars that all of the oil companies are raking in the last few months. She just conveniently doesn't talk about that. She sounds to me like she is defending the, uh, the, the billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of profit from all of the oil majors. What did she just say? Uh, they are still not high enough to satisfy the high price needs of energy producers and producers truly require higher prices. So this is Gail Tverberg who knows a lot more about the subject than Sam Mitchell ever will. Okay? Alright. It is my expectation that these and other issues will lead to a very strangely behaving world economy in the months and years ahead. The world economy we know today is in fact a self-organizing system operating under the laws of physics. With less energy, it will start coming apart. World trade will increasingly falter. Fossil fuel prices will be volatile, but not necessarily very high. In this post, I will try to explain some of the issues I see. And all I'm going to do here, guys, is just read the, uh, the first, you know, bold-faced bullet without, you know, breaking down all the stuff in the middle. Uh, if you're interested in this, I highly advise you to go on this link and fill in the missing blanks. But these are the high points. Number one, the issue causing the price conflict can be described as reduced productivity of the economy. The ultimate outcome of reduced productivity of the economy is fewer total goods and services produced by the economy. 
All right, and then she spends a chapter on that. So in her next chapter, in the past, the growth rate of GDP has ex the growth rate of you know total GDP has exceeded that of energy consumption. As the economy changes from growth to shrinkage, we should expect this situation to reverse. The rate of shrinkage of GDP will be greater than the rate of shrinkage of energy consumption. And she breaks that down. Okay. Bullet number three. Interest rates play an important role in encouraging the development of energy resources. Generally, falling interest rates are very beneficial. Rising interest rates are quite detrimental at, you know, at encouraging the development of energy resources. As the economy shifts towards shrinkage, the pattern we can expect is, and what we're seeing, is higher interest rates rather than lower as limits of energy extraction are hit, these higher rates will tend to make the economy shrink even faster than it would otherwise shrink. All right, then she breaks that down. Point four, <clears throat> with fewer goods and services produced by the economy, the world economy must eventually shrink. We should not be surprised if this shrinkage in some ways echoes the shrinkage that took place in the 2008-2009 recession and the 2020 shutdowns. Uh, let's see, then she well, I'm not going to get into the corona panic, talking about how the, uh, how the cure was worse for, than the disease. Uh, anyway, next, number five, there is likely to be more conflict in a world with not enough goods and services to go around. Do you think so? With a shrinking amount of finished goods and services, we should not be surprised if we see more conflict in the world. Many wars are resource wars. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, anyway, I would like to play around with that resource wars, but you can go on here. Number six, we seem to be facing a new set of problems in addition to the problems that gave rise to the corona panic shutdowns. These are likely to shape how any new crisis plays out. Uh, and then she breaks uh, all of that down. Any, any one of these could be a, uh, I, I could make 10 ramps out of this. Uh, you just have to do this or take this one yourself, guys. Okay, number seven. <clears throat> Many parts of the economy are likely to find that the promised payments to be made to them cannot really take place. Yes. Uh, do you think so? We don't know precisely what will happen, but here are a few of her ideas. Many businesses will fail. Employees and governments will default on debts. Banks will have difficulty remaining solvent. Pension plans will have nowhere nearly enough money to pay promised employees. The international system of trade is likely to start withering away. 
Uh, anyway, this goes on and on. Number nine, it is likely that in inflation-adjusted dollars, energy prices will not rise very high for very long. Yes, we are likely dealing with an economy that is basically falling apart. Yes. Uh, and uh, to the conclusion. Okay, boiling it all down, Gail. Boiling down this book-length manuscript. In conclusion, we are dealing with a situation that economists, politicians, and central banks are ill-equipped to handle. Raising interest rates may squeeze out a huge share of the economy. The economy was already at the edge. We cannot know for certain, but we're getting ready to find out. Virtually no one looks at the economy from a physics point of view. For one thing, the result is too distressing to explain this to citizens. For another, it is fashionable for scientists of all types to produce papers and have them peer-reviewed by others written within their own ivory towers. Economists, politicians, and central bankers do not care about the physics of the situation. Even those basing their analysis on energy return on energy invested tend to focus only on a narrow portion of what I explained in section one, which you'll have to go up there and read. Once researchers have invested a huge amount of time and effort in one direction, they cannot consider the possibility that their approach may be seriously incomplete. Unfortunately, the physics-based approach I am using indicates that the world economy is likely to change dramatically for the worse in the months and years ahead. Economies in general cannot last forever. Populations outgrow their resource bases. Hmm. Resources become too depleted. Wow. In physical terms, economies are dissipative structures, not unlike ecosystems, plants, and animals. They can only exist for a limited time before they die or end their operation. They tend to be replaced by new, similar dissipative structures. While the current world economy cannot last indefinitely, humans have continued to exist through many bottlenecks in the past, including ice ages. It is likely that some humans, perhaps in mutated form, will make it through the current bottleneck. These humans will likely create a new economy that is better adapted to the earth as it changes. Well, with that little bit of hopium, I'm hoping she's right that we have some serious uh, genetic mutations happening. PDQ here with the new humans making it through the bottleneck. Uh, anyway, it is always good to have Gail try to put this in language that even I can understand. Uh, but Kurt Cobb and uh, Gail Tverberg, uh, you can find them on oilprice.com. 
quite a bit. But I'm going to wrap it up and enjoy this lovely, cool, rainy evening here in the collapse at Bugs in a Jar Farm, where we're going to be having a party next week next month hope you guys can make it so we can party like it's 1999 while uh, we still can bye guys